Where's a god like me more than your butcher's boy? Burn it hey guys, it's Kev. Your dancing master. In this video, I want to address what I consider to be the biggest misconception in Game of Thrones Season 6. I'll play one short clip to give you a last chance to close out if you need to. Long story short, I am going to propose why I think that Davos raised Jon from the dead, not Melisandre, as well as how I think he did it. In order to do this, we will break this video into five sections. Thoros of Mir's backstory. Power attribution, in other words, who has the power, gods or men. A comparison of Davos and Melisandre during the events of early season 6 because their dispositions were in stark contrast to one another, or should I say, snow contrast. A breakdown of the resurrection scene from this new perspective and a quick look at the implications that this theory has, if it is true. Here we go. First, we are going to look at Thoros and Beric, and in order to analyze Beric Dondarrion's resurrections, it's important to first understand Thoros' backstory. Thoros was the youngest of eight children, and he was given to the Red Temple of Rolor as a young child. This was not a path he would have chosen for himself. By the time I came to Westeros, I didn't believe in Hellor. He was sent to Westeros to convert Mad King Ares from the Faith of the Seven to the Lord of the Light. Mad King Ares had seemed like a good candidate, since he liked fire. But Thoros liked drinking, fighting, and women, and he failed to convert both the Mad King and Bobby B to the Lord of Light. But the biggest takeaway here is that you need to realize that Thoros did not believe in the Lord of Light. I decided that he, that all the gods were stories we told the children to make them behave. After Gregor killed Beric for the first time, Thoros knelt over his body and gave Beric the last kiss. In the show, he said a prayer. Out of nowhere, Beric comes back to life. This surprised Thoros, and his faith in the Lord of Light was renewed, or in a sense, even though Thoros is a red priest of Rolor, this was when his faith in Rolor was born. And for the first time in my life, the Lord replied. He ends up raising Beric from the dead six times. The sixth time was when the Hound killed him. Since he attributes this power to Rolor, I always have two. Yet at times, I claim that the gods are not real. So there's clearly a disconnect, which brings us to section two. Who really has the power? Gods or people? Short answer, people. There are no gods. You were right all along. The Lord never spoke to me. Fuck them then. Fuck all of them. There is only one God, and his name is Death. The answer is magic. Magic has returned to Planetos. This is why the dragons were hatched, or maybe magic has grown because the dragons have hatched. Your dragons were born. Our magic was born again. It is strongest in their presence, and they are strongest in yours. Either way, I believe that Thoros and Melisandre enacted their miracles by tapping into an invisible river of magic, so to say. It's a river that anyone can access, but the key ingredient to tapping into this power source is self-belief. Picture Melisandre in the past. No one was as confident as her, except maybe a two-handed Jamie Lannister. There are three men in the kingdoms who might have a chance against me. You're not one of them. And Jojen Reed was pretty confident, too. Because Melisandre's belief was so strong, she was able to tap into the magic of the world and perform miracles. She happens to falsely attribute these superpowers to Rolor, but the fact of the matter is, she believed that miracles were possible, and as a result, she made those miracles a reality, the law of attraction. Now let's apply this concept to Thoros. As we mentioned earlier, Thoros did not have the same unwavering belief in a fake god that Melisandre had, but what he did have was real love for a friend, Beric Dondarrion. When Beric dies in the show, Thoros said a prayer. Not because I believed in them, but he was my friend, and he was dead. When Beric rose from the dead, Thoros falsely attributed it to Rolor, just like Melisandre does. This fake anchor allows him to hold on strongly to true belief that miracles are possible, and as a result, he raises Beric five more times. But in actuality, what is really happening is that Thoros simply wills Beric back to life through the Law of Attraction. Power resides where men believe it resides. Now let's fast forward to season 6 to compare Davos and Melisandre around the time of Jon's death. Now, you are dead. Davos is the one to hear ghost howling and finds Jon's body, and it was Davos' idea to bring Jon inside. When the others carried him off, Davos pauses to stare at the blood. The wheels in his head are already spinning. He's wondering, how and why did this happen? But he may already be wondering whether or not Melisandre can bring Jon back to life. While Jon's friends mourn, Davos begins to initiate plans to protect Jon Snow's body, even though Jon is already dead. 
He asks them who they can trust and if they have a relationship with the dire wolf ghost, and advises them to get the wildlings to come back to Castle Black to help in the fight. But it's important to note that he doesn't plan on just going down swinging like Dolores Head suggests. We all die today. What do we say to the god of death? We need to fight, but we don't need to die. Basically, Davos has not given up faith in Jon Snow or faith in himself. He hasn't taken his eyes off the bigger picture, the war versus the dead army. So even though Melisandre is his arch rival of sorts, when Melisandre knocks, he nods to the brothers to let her in because... Who's always the red woman? What's one redhead gonna do against 40 armed men? You haven't seen her do what I've seen her do. So now let's check in with Melisandre and see where she stands. When Melisandre sees Jon lying on the table, she loses faith in him. And as a result, she loses faith in Rolor, and most importantly, she loses faith in herself, almost instantaneously. Everything I believed, the great victory I saw in the flames, all of it was a lie. Since she loses her faith, she no longer has the ability to perform miracles. A great man once said, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and good things never die. Unlike Mel, Davos holds on to hope. Do you know of... Any magic that could help him bring him back. Melisandre continues to display her loss of faith in this scene. I saw you drink poison that should have killed you. I saw you give birth to a demon made of shadows. But Davos is able to convince her to give it a shot anyway, at least a half ass shot. I'm not a devout man, obviously. Seven gods, drowned gods, tree gods, it's all the same. I'm not asking the Lord of Light for help. I'm asking the woman who showed me that miracles exist. So now let's finally revisit the resurrection scene. Melisandre walks over to Jon, cleans his wounds, shaves his beard, cuts his hair, and even washes his hair to get Kit Harrington all pretty for his resurrection. She then burns his hair as a sacrifice to the Lord of Light, places her hands on him, and says a prayer in High Valyrian. But she's missing the only ingredient that actually counts. She doesn't believe in herself anymore. Davos looks over to Tormund, who is not very impressed. And these couple seconds right here, when Mel looks over at Davos and the camera changes focus, this symbolizes a transition. Now we will begin the dance. Until now, Davos had been focusing on Melisandre, relying on her to perform a miracle. But in this moment, Davos finally realizes that Melisandre is worthless right now. Now it's on him, Sir Davos of House Seaworth, the Onion Knight. Tormund gives up hope, he leaves. Melisandre gives up hope if she had any left to give up on, and she leaves. Our boy Dollar's Ed gives up hope, and he leaves. I'm sorry to see you leave. But the White Wolves are still there, and so is Davos. He's confused. He has visualized John's resurrection, yet John hasn't come back to life. So he walks over to John and starts taking matters into his own hands. Like we just said, he's no longer focusing on Melisandre. His entire focus is now on Jon Snow. The water dance. He then turns and leaves as well. But unlike the others, I do not think that he gave up hope as he walks away. Imagine this. He walks out the door, but he's not thinking, I was wrong. John's done. He's thinking, Not today. Come on, man. You gotta wake up. We need you. And boom, that's the magical moment. That's when the miracle happens. He's not at John's side when it happens, but that doesn't matter. It's the mind and the connection to magic that is what's most important. Even as Davos walks away, he is connected with John in spirit. More than ever. And thus, Davos wills John back to life through the law of attraction. He did it because he believed that the world needs John. He believed that John would come back to life. He believed with a capital B, and he should forever be known as Sir Davos Seaworth, the Onion Wizard. If this theory is true, it could have far-reaching implications, because I'm suggesting that everyone can perform miracles. Boy, girl, you are the sword. Granted, most people probably won't ever tap into the magic of the world because this isn't Harry Potter. These people live in a world where they look at magic as a myth. Even the people who perform the miracles, like Thoros and Melisandre, they attribute their own powers to fake gods since they can't even imagine having these powers to themselves. On top of that, everyone in the story is constantly going through trials and tribulations, which makes it hard to truly believe in anything. But belief may be the key to victory in the wars to come. They have to lift up their heads and believe that they can perform miracles, because they have no other option. If they don't, they're all going to die. The sea. The true sea. That is the heart of swordplay. So here are my three questions to y'all. Number one, do you think that the gods are real? Number two, how do you think John came back to life? Melisandre, Davos, Ghost, Bran, Bloodraven? And number three, 
if you buy into the Seven Heroes theory that we started discussing a couple weeks ago, do you think that the Seven Heroes will perform miracles of their own? Or do you think that the Seven Heroes will perform humanly acts and simply be looked at as gods or weapons of the gods? And does this theory already exist? Does it have a name other than the Onion Wizard theory? And please let me know in the comments section if you've seen or heard about this theory before, and if there's anywhere I can read up more on the theory in terms of its strengths and weaknesses. You were not seeing. I was so. I watched, but you- Watching is not seeing, dead girl. Special thank you to Frank and Pez, the executive producers of this channel. I'm trying to get them to invite me onto Way Off Topic Radio so that I can overcome my fear of doing stuff live, so please hit them up on social media and tell them to make it happen. I'll throw links in the video description of this video. And I also want to welcome aboard Fluffer Nutter, who's joining Oliver Haney as a Bridge 4 co-executive producer. I'm actually going to get Brian Kennedy's take on this before I make it public, so if I do make it public and you think it's insane, blame the craziness on her. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to make it public regardless. Don't associate this insanity with her. She's way better at this than myself. In the next video, we're going to explore the Battle of Blackwater, so hit subscribe if you want to see that. Until next time, though, this is Kev. I'll talk to you.